Hello YouTube, this is Will, and I'm back after a rather long hiatus. Some time ago, I promised to do a video on the subject of nested hierarchies. The idea of a nested hierarchy is often promoted as strong evidence in favor of evolution by variation and natural selection, but based on what I've seen, most people on YouTube, including some proponents of evolution, don't seem to understand what a nested hierarchy actually is. They understand the idea of a hierarchy well enough, but not too many seem to have a grasp on the nested part. In this video, I'll attempt to clearly illustrate a nested hierarchy, and then to show how such a hierarchy can be used to make useful predictions about what we can expect to find in the fossil record. For most of this discussion, we'll be looking at sets of eight-letter words. Each of the eight character positions within the word could be viewed as representing an independent property, and different letters at that position can be seen as variations of that property. Now before I show a nested hierarchy, let me illustrate a hierarchy which is not nested. In this first set of words, we can make groupings based on their properties. If we connect them in the most natural way, by linking each to the most similar word in the list, we get an unpredictable web of interconnections. Many of these interconnections form closed loops. With a closed loop, there is no natural sense of order among traits. Their ranking must be completely arbitrary. In order to group them in a convenient way, we could attempt to impose a hierarchy. For example, we could group them by their first letter, second letter, third letter, and so on. By arbitrarily ranking the traits this way, based on alphabetical sorting, we could create an artificial hierarchy within the list, like so. This appears to solve the dilemma of closed loops and ranking traits, but the solution is an illusion. If someone tries to build a hierarchy based on the same alphabetical order, but reads the words instead from right to left, a completely different hierarchy arises. And this is before even considering that alphabetical order is, in itself, completely arbitrary. Now let's consider a different set of eight-letter words. Like the previous set, we could attempt to force a hierarchy by weighting the different traits, first letter, second letter, and so on. But if we group them naturally by looking at the degree of similarity between them, we get a very clear branching structure based solely on an objective consideration of the properties. Notice that there are no closed loops in this structure, which means that we can determine a natural ordering of the properties. This is important to remember. The closed loop is the greatest enemy of nested hierarchies. If a closed loop can be demonstrated, the hierarchy is not nested. This is why when creationists attempt to make a farce of this natural order by placing man-made items into some artificial nested hierarchy, they utterly fail, because all I have to do is produce a bicycle with an enclosed cabin and their entire construct falls apart. And when they object that evolutionists do the same thing when we claim that superficially similar traits can arise by convergent evolution, they likewise fail, because we have empirical evidence to back that up. When we examine their morphological and genetic basis, we see that their similarities are only skin deep, and these features are at a fundamental level entirely different. What makes these creationist efforts even more ironic is, at the same time they try to force man-made objects into a nested hierarchy structure, they demand, as proof of evolution, the very types of creatures that would completely violate that structure. Instead of asking for crocoducks, they should be demanding examples of basal archosaurs, the common ancestors of both ducks and crocodiles. Oh, that's right, we already have them. Several, in fact. Which leads me to the next point. The highest ordered members of a nested hierarchy retain a record of the lower orders, which can in turn be used to make predictions about the properties of those members. Returning to our sample nested hierarchy, imagine that we discover a new species. When we attempt to connect this to the most similar word in the list, we can see that three properties have changed. Now we don't know what order these properties changed, but we can nevertheless predict that the changes accumulated one at a time, a pattern supported by the rest of the hierarchy. Thus we can predict the possible intermediates between the ancestor and the extant species. Now let's imagine that another species is discovered whose nearest match is the same ancestor. When we repeat the same process to predict the intermediates, we see that some of these intermediates are exactly the same as those predicted previously, and we can then eliminate the predictions that do not converge. In fact, if we repeat the same process with a few more species, we can theoretically predict the exact lineage that led to these species, even without directly observing the intermediates. 
Indeed, the ability of a theory to make such useful predictions is one of the key measures of its success, and the nested hierarchy predicted by evolution has come through repeatedly in that regard. Perhaps the most celebrated example of this is Tiktaalik, an intermediate between fish and tetrapods. Using techniques similar to those I just demonstrated, researchers were able to predict not just the features, but also the age and location of just such an intermediate. It took paleontologists in the field almost three years to validate that prediction, but what they finally found was such a strong blow in favor of evolution that it made international headlines in the mainstream media, and all the usual creationist suspects hastily produced refutations within hours, which they were somehow able to do without direct examination of the evidence, a fact that alone should be enough to make all but the most brainwashed skeptical of their science. Tiktaalik has since become an icon of sorts, and, like Archaeopteryx, it has been subjected to the usual battery of creationist abuse and denialism. In my own discussions with Nephilim Free, for example, he first claimed the fins didn't ossify, I sent him photographs, then clarified that he meant the fin rays didn't fossilize, I sent him more photographs, and finally retreated to the old standby that it was still just a fish. I sent him a list of its tetrapod-like characteristics alongside a contrasting list of the corresponding features of a modern fish. But Tiktaalik is not the only example where researchers have used this method of prediction to find specific intermediates. In 2004, a research team used just such a method to find relatively unexamined discoveries that might be near the divergence of frogs and salamanders. They succeeded. One last word on nested hierarchies and evolution. The nested hierarchy of living organisms and their fossilized ancestors that was predicted by Darwin and confirmed by morphology has been repeatedly confirmed since. Not just the morphology, but also the karyotypes, peptide sequences, and genetic codes support the same nested hierarchy. Some may counter that if morphology is under genetic control, we should expect this, but in making that claim, they are disregarding the so-called wobble hypothesis in the genetic code. Some nucleotides can be changed with no effect at all on the transcribed proteins, and even within the proteins, some peptides can be substituted with no effect on the protein function. There is absolutely no reason that these trivial sequences should remain similar in seemingly related organisms unless, in fact, they are related due to common ancestry.